So welcome to Wednesday night at Living Word Family Church. This is these final days ministries. I'm Pastor Ryan Speakman, serving under my favorite pastor in the whole world, Pastor Maureen Collins. Yeah. Always one honor her. And uh, we're going to have a great time tonight because, again, this is our last night together for a whole month, so we better have time and squeeze every drop we can. Just a couple of very quick news items. Uh, Ryan. First of all, yes, sir. Mike. Yes, thank you. Yeah, why do I keep doing that? That's two weeks in a row now with the mic. But that's okay. I did that last week for like the first three or four or five minutes, and the other mics picked me up okay. So, yeah, boy. Okay, that's – I'll get that in my head. Again, you start caring about Yeah, and, and look, this time yeah, – this, this time I said it here so I wouldn't forget. And Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, happy Hanukkah. We, uh, tonight is the fourth night of Hanukkah. Uh, and, of course, this goes on for eight nights. You guys probably know. Um, this Friday at the uh, synagogue here in town, if you'd like to come to the Hanukkah service, Skylar and I will be there. I, I always take Skylar. We've been going every year for like six, six years now, I think at least. It's, it's really a lot of fun. So uh, I think that's, if I remember right, that's at 7.30 this Friday at the synagogue if you'd like to come to that. Um, and uh, so you, you guys know that I try to minimize the news in here, but uh, we would be um, definitely remiss if we did not uh, mention this gentleman and uh, show him some honor here. So. Uh, we all know, I think we've all heard, right, that um, President George H.W. Bush, this is uh, Bush 41, uh, President number 41, uh, passed away last Friday in, in uh, Houston. And uh, a great man. He's actually the first uh, president that I voted for. I turned 21 in 1989. So that would mean that I voted for him. Yes. Go ahead and clap. I don't know what you're clapping for because I turned 21. That was a while ago. <laughs> but, uh, but so... If my math is right, that means that I voted for his second term, uh, which he, he didn't get. Uh, Bill Clinton, we know, you know, won that election. So, But uh, uh, George Bush Sr., he was actually in the White House, we know, for, uh, even though we only served one term as president, he was in the White House for 12 years because he served for eight years under uh, Ronald Reagan as the vice president. And, uh, and we might even say that he was in the White House in a way for 20 years because yeah. later on his son, uh, George W., uh, Bush 43, uh, became president. He did serve two terms. So during that eight years, you can just imagine, you know, uh, George W. was probably on the phone every day to his dad, right, getting advice or whatever. Um, super impactful. We, we'll actually talk more about uh, President <coughs> Bush later on in our study once we get to that point, uh, because there there were um, things that he was involved in that were very impactful to our story, the story of the end times. Uh, you know, we know that he, uh, as Ronald Reagan's vice president presided over the, the decline and, and finally the collapse of the Soviet Union. Huge deal, oh my gosh. Uh, and uh, George Bush is actually, um, he actually is famous, of course he didn't coin the term, but, uh, but he, when he used the term New World Order uh, to describe you know, the, the, the early years after the Soviet Union collapsed, you know, the Cold War's over, what are we going into now? And it was really amazing because for about 10 years, we, you know, none of us really understood what, what the world was going to shape up to look like. Yeah. And that, of course, was answered for us on the morning of September 11, 2001, mm -hmm. when the World Trade Center attack took place. That's, that's when it became clear what the New World Order really would be. Uh, the other major uh, thing that uh, George Bush um, did during his presidency, I mean, the, the one major thing, really, was, uh, was the war against Saddam Hussein in Iraq, and, uh, which, of course, uh, he didn't really complete the job. And we're going to talk about that and what effect that had <coughs> over the next 10 years and even leading into, of course, the, the Iraq war that his son then engaged in to try to finish the job, uh, even leading on eventually into the Arab Spring and everything that, that, that's going to... So all the, all the dots connect. We'll get to all that later. Meantime, just wanted to honor him. Why don't we give him a hand? Great man, great president. Yeah, kind of... Kind of uh, kind of a man of a different era, and, and I, for one, I'm sorry that that era is over. Wouldn't even know how to describe it, just a uh, lot of civility in the country, even at that time. I mean, you know, people on, on both sides of the aisle have always criticized who's ever in office, but um, I remember, you know, during his presidency, there was still some modicum of honor and respect yeah. for that office that we're just not seeing today. So I, I, I definitely, for one, miss those days. So anyways, all right, so let's uh, get into our study. So uh, Mike, K&LB Mike, which uh, period are we discussing? 
Uh, Weimar? Yes, <laughs> the period when in Germany, it was a period that we call the Weimar Republic, or Weimar, and uh, that was the, uh, the interwar period, so this is what we're into now. So we've, we've, uh, we, we discussed last week um, in a lot of detail uh, the Paris Peace Conference, actually last couple of weeks, the Paris Peace Conference, which was the years-long conference, about five years long, that, uh, that, that commenced to um, create all the treaties that would, that would kind of officially bring to an end all the, all the aspects of World War I. And the most impactful of those, of course, was the, uh, the Treaty of Versailles. We talked about that at length last week and looked um, uh, very clearly at, at how uh, that eventually led to the rise of the Nazis and, of course, World War II. So uh, um, another major thing to come out of the Paris Peace Conference, uh, in a way the most major thing, well, I'm going to go and say it. I'll, I'll label it that, as arbitrary as it is. Uh, the most impactful thing to come out of the Paris Peace Conference was this. Huge, hugely prophetic event here. Okay, so can anyone guess what this is? The Hall of Mills. Uh, no, uh, good guess though. That's where the Paris Peace Conference took place. Um, this, was, this was a brand new organization. In fact, a whole brand new kind of organization that was born out of the Paris. Yes, thank you. Who said that? Sharon, yeah, Gold Star. I think you guys all knew, right? Yeah, this is the this is the League of Nations. Uh, the League of Nations was was established on January tenth, nineteen twenty, and again, this came out of the Paris Peace Conference, and uh, and this was this was literally the world's first uh, attempt at actual world government. Okay, and and uh, in a way, it's it's a very uh, interesting form that that, that this government took. Uh, and that's what we might call a, a kind of democracy, all right? So, so it's really a, a democracy of, of all of the nations of the world. It wasn't really all. At, at the height of uh, uh, the, the League of Nations, which went on, the League of Nations uh, went on for 26 years, from 1920 all the way, of course, to, to uh, the end of World War II. Uh, 1946, they were finally officially dissolved because they were replaced by... The United Nations. Of course, yeah, Gold Star, but... Okay, so, but uh, this is the form that uh, world government takes, democracy, and democracy is a good thing, right? Isn't that good? <laughs> Everybody's like, find democracy. No. <laughs> Ryan and his, twi and his trick <laughs> question. Did you find democracy in its base terms? <laughs> Which is? It's mob rule. Mm-hmm. That's what democracy means, is mob rule. That's how, how rude of you to say, and that's exactly how our founding fathers referred to it. Uh, Thomas Jefferson calls it the tyranny of the majority, so... So it really is, and, and, and we especially see that concept. You guys all hear what Kurt said, mob rule? Mm -hmm. Doesn't yeah. that sound kind of nasty? And, and it's right. And we see this in play uh, today more than ever before. Um, look at Israel. I mean, is, Israel is, is, is the, the, uh, the, the little skinny kid on the playground that, that all the bullies are just, just attacking on a constant basis. We'll get into all that later on. But, um, but world government, I mean, sounds like a great idea, especially after this horrible calamity that we call World War I, something the world had never seen before. And again, this is a manifestation of which horseman, Cheryl? The second horseman. Very good, Gold Star. The second horseman, World War. So uh, this is mankind's answer to World War. Well, we're, we're going to form a world government. And uh, this is, um, uh, I'll just read my notes here. This is the first international organization uh, and its principal mission was to maintain world peace. Doesn't that sound good? And, and we as Christians, I mean, it just, it's a red flag. You know, international organization, and they're going to maintain world yeah. peace. Um, and, and, and why do we know that that's just absurd? That it's just, it's just a great deception because, because only God, o peace only comes through God. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And, and of course, the world government, that's the whole idea of it. It's man ruling man. Remember Protagoras? Man is the measure of all things. It's secular humanism. We're going to run this thing ourselves. And, uh, and we as Christians know that it, it, that's deception. It, it, is, it is great deception. And we know where it's headed, right? Uh, so its primary goals, as stated in its covenant, included preventing wars through collective security and disarmament and settling international disputes through negotiation and arbitration. It sounds good, right? So, so uh, their, their vision was um, just how uh, Woodrow Wilson had, had termed it, and uh, he used this phrase in reference to, to this whole 
this, this, this whole um, phenomenon, World War I, uh, the Paris Peace Conference, all the treaties, including the Treaty of Versailles, and then finally the League of Nations. And so this was uh, Woodrow Wilson's very, very famous uh, optimistic quote. Come on, somebody. And, and remember, he, he borrowed this from a famous 19th century writer. Remember this? The war, back on my screen. The, the war to end all wars. <laughs> and this was their goal. This was their intent at uh, the Paris Peace Conference and then with the establishment of the League of Nations, this was the intent that we would never have war again, that mankind has the ability, yeah, Tom's over there laughing, right? No kidding. We would never ever have war again. This was their, their full intent. We, we're, we're not gonna tolerate this. We can't afford this again. You know, all the uh, you know, millions of lives lost in World War I, the, the you know, horrendous uh, damage that came out of it. The, the, the tremendous cost, it was just too expensive to humanity, this, the, this, this, this thing, you know, world war. So we're going to come together, we're going we're gonna to cooperate, we're going to form a democracy, and we're going to, to enforce peace in this world. You see the fallacy of that? Yeah. I mean, it's easy to see in hindsight, yeah. but as Christians, we should see it just from a spiritual. Kurt had his hand up first. I just have another quote that he is famous for, which he said right before we sent troops into World War I, was that he, there shall go forth to make the world safe for democracy. Oh yeah, I remember that. He said that, and nobody had ever used that term, democracy, in that way. Oh really? Okay, interesting. Because I do remember the quote. That was Woodrow Wilson. Yeah, uh, very important guy. Now you remember um, Shelley? Uh, what his role was in 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 the world? What position did he hold? Why am I picking on you? <laughs> so we just honored a great man, George uh, Herbert Walker Bush, who was our 40, 41st president. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was our something something president. Allen. I should look that up. I didn't think I'd mention this, but yeah, whatever number he was, he was a president of the United States. And uh, this guy was a major globalist, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Major one worlder, which is of course why he absolutely had a hand in this in this whole process. Because, and it wasn't because he was evil. I mean, he looks a little evil in the picture, but he wasn't evil. He was a nice guy, right? Um, it's always with good intent. Uh, it's always right. And what's that saying? The road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? But it's always with good intent. Um, listen, I mean, I could name names in here that you guys would bristle, so I won't name names. But we've had presidents in recent times who maybe a lot of us in here didn't care for. You know, we didn't like his policies. Um, I'm talking about President Obama. Um, and, you know, a couple of people in here maybe even voted for him, whatever. But, uh, but, but he had good intention. I absolutely believe that. You guys might disagree with me on that. No. But, but I think that in a way the guy... Yeah, I, I think in a way at least his heart was in the right place. He, he, yeah, he thought, I, I believe that he sincerely believed in his heart and beliefs of this day that, that he was doing what, what's best for humanity. We know differently, huh? Yeah, okay, that's, that's cool. I mean, I, I see what you're saying, yeah, and I, I don't want to get into debate about And I didn't vote for him, so, anyways. Go ahead, Sharon, you had your hand up. Of, and you don't realize it, but it's reinventing the Tower of Babel. Okay. Only hugely. Did you peek at my notes? No. Okay, we're getting ahead of me in my notes. I know. So gold wise. star for that. Why did I say that? No, I said you're wise. <laughs> it makes oh, me mad whenever you guys yeah, do that, but you always get a gold star because I'm impressed. Uh, I actually. That was Babel was man trying to rule everything on his terms. That's exactly, that's exactly right. We'll, we'll get to that in one second. I've got one other quote I want to show you because there was, there was a, a, a British a senior officer, okay, he, was, he actually, um, he served in World War I. His name was uh, Archibald Waddell. I'm probably butchering his name. Um, later on, he served in World War II, so this guy was, uh, was active during the, the uh, interwar period. In World War II, he was the commander in chief of the British forces in the Middle East. Hello. So, yeah. so this guy, he served in World War I, saw the whole story play out throughout the interwar period, right? And then served in World War II in the Middle East. And uh, uh, this, this was his response years later to this quote. But, but you know, so this was a very famous quote. Everybody knew what the intent was, and this is what he said later on, but this became a famous quote in itself. He says, after the war to end war, 
reference to uh, what Woodrow Wilson said, they seem to have been pretty successful in Paris at making a peace to end peace. <laughs> you get that? I love that play on words. Yeah, great play on words. So what they called peace, the Paris Peace Conference, that it was a peace to end all peace is, is a good way of putting it. Oh, I didn't finish my point about that uh, quote, or that term, that phrase, the war to end all wars. Uh, he, I, I think I said in an earlier class, I'm sure I did, that, uh, that, that it was H.G. Wells that had originally coined that term. And I thought I read somewhere that it was in the book, The War of the Worlds, which I never read. I've seen every version yeah. of the movie, a couple good ones. Uh, but, but actually, this is interesting. H.G. Wells did coin that term, uh, the war to end all wars, but uh, it was in a series of essays that he wrote between 1914 and 1918 during World War I. So H.G. Wells did coin it. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was actually using it just the way that um, H.G. Wells meant it, which is this war is so huge and catastrophic, we just can't afford to have another war. But then, doesn't this guy make a good point? You know, we've never heard yeah. of him, but look, he's got a famous quote out there. <laughs> um, and it's such a good point. It was, it was actually a peace to end all peace, right? So let's talk about, let's, we're going we're gonna to take a little bit of time and we're going to, uh, we'll do this again later when we get to the United Nations because that's, that's actually the, the, the much more pertinent um, permutation of world government. And there's only two. And, and they're, they're in a way, well, I'm not going to say they'll, 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 there will only be two for the rest of history. I don't know what's coming later, what kind of a, a, a system we might see under the Antichrist. But so far, there's been two. But uh, when, we get, when we get to the United Nations, we're going to look at this topic a little bit more closely. But right now, I, wanna, I, I do want to talk about the roots of rural government because I want to pause and I want us to understand um, just how important this is to our story. Uh, again, first time in human history, thousands and thousands of years of human history, and for the first time ever, just 100 years ago. I mean, right? Wasn't it just a few weeks ago we, we commemorated the 100-year anniversary of the end of World War I? So it's been just in the last one century, which is just kind of a blink of an eye in, in, in terms of human history, uh, we finally have this, this we, you know, true world government. So uh, what are the roots of world government? And what did, what did Sharon say a minute ago, which is, which is wisdom? Yeah, for sure. And we talked about this before. The Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel. So we know that this is, this is a, a story that we read about in uh, Genesis chapter 11. So it's after the time of, of the flood, right? Uh, and so it's really, you know, current human civilization, if you want to, you know, term it that way. And uh, uh, what was the story of the Tower of Babel? Somebody want to recap? Because I want to sip my coffee. Then this is good. To it's control everything and try to be God when you're not God. That's, that's the gist of it. That's the gist of it. Trying to be God when they're not God. So uh, there was a guy named Nimrod, and he and his people... Uh, found found this perfect spot on the plains of Shinar, okay, and uh, and they built this tower, and their intent was to build it up to to heaven, mm -hmm. all right. And uh, was God worried? Oh my gosh, if I let them continue, they're going to invade heaven. I mean, come on. Nope. Yeah, they didn't have the technology to go very very tall back then. But it was the spirit behind it. It was the intent behind it, and they and they all were in agreement. They all spoke one yeah, language. There's, there's the problem. Now, th here's what God says in response. It's Genesis chapter 11, and I won't put the verse up. I'll just read it. Uh, the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin yeah. to do. It's not that they were going to succeed in doing anything, no. but it was the intent. Okay. Uh, now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. So at that time, it wasn't nearly time yet for, for uh, humans to succeed in this endeavor, but it was only delayed, and God, of course, knew that. He was only delaying it. But, uh, but, but the Bible tells us that he confused their speech. They couldn't understand each other, and they just scattered. They, they couldn't even communicate anymore, so he confused their speech. So um, what, what are the parallels that we see today uh, to the Tower of Babel? That, that, this wasn't even true 100 years ago. Go ahead, Sharon. Nations coming together with one purpose. Well, we see the League of Nations, yeah. and, then, and then a much more yeah, successful attempt at world government, which is the United Nations. Don't throw rocks at me for saying that. I'm not saying they're successful. I'm saying much more successful than the League of Nations. Uh, it's a disaster. It's supposed to be. It's prophesied to be, right? But, uh, but what about this aspect? Indeed, the people are one. That's what you just said. And they all have one language. Yeah. This just sends chills up my spine. They all have one language. Yeah, English. Look at us today. I mean, uh, do we have just, just one language in the world? Yes, we do. 
you could say, oh no, I mean, my next door neighbor speaks Spanish, and then the guy on the other side speaks, you know, Arabic or whatever, right? Um, do we all have one language in the world today? 100%. Anybody here been overseas? I've been all over. I've been South America and, and no, Soviet Union and Europe and Asia. Huh? Yeah, most places you can go, someone speaks English. Yeah, I, exactly, because that's the li lingua franca of the world, which means the, the international language. Uh, it's, it's what everybody speaks. And, you know, we could say, well, you know, um, during, even during the time of Jesus, there was a lingua franca, which was Latin, right? That's what the, the Roman Empire yeah. spoke. And that's, that's basically true. Greek. Yeah. Actually, it was Greek. Oh, was, was that the spoken language? I thought it was yeah, Latin. Greek. Well, they wrote, they, wrote, they wrote in Greek, yeah. The, the um, scholars used the uh, Latin. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the common language was Greek. Oh, okay. Greek. Okay, I don't know why I thought that the spoken language was, was... I don't know why I was thinking that anyways. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Kurt. Yeah, you were talking about English, but every major airport in the world, the towers speak English. Yeah. Uh, the tower, that's, a very, that's a very good example. Do you guys hear what Kurt said? I love that. He says, every, every tower at every airport in the entire world, that's what air traffic control speaks is English. That's one example of hundreds and hundreds, okay? So um, uh, now we have uh, the internet, okay? We have the World Wide Web. Um, go ahead, Shell. What is, just curious, what's the meaning in Hebrew for language? What's the meaning of it? The meaning, I don't know what you mean. The, the meaning for language. For yeah, the word. I'm not even sure what the what the word is for. I know ya yazik in yazik in Russian means language. Um, I don't know what the word is in Hebrew for language, but it would just mean language, you know. Um, although it's interesting, just kind of a complete side point. But since you bring it up, uh, the Jews believe that Hebrew is the language of heaven, and maybe it is. It's kind of cool. So, so when I get to heaven, I know about like. Three or four phrases, that's about it. So, anyways, so give, Hebrew, give me a good start. So, if the Hebrew believes <laughs> language is from heaven? That that's, that's, what the Jews, that's what the Jews say, yeah. So, if the Bible that's says that there's only one language, you know, are they talking about? I believe it does say yeah. that's going to oh, come. I, it does say that somewhere, and I believe it's in Isaiah, or it might be in Jeremiah. Somewhere, I can get reading that, that <laughs> language I'm just was God's. Um, spoken language. That, that Isaiah says his, what? His spoken language. Isaiah says that Hebrew is I'm God's. I'm not exactly sure if it's Isaiah. Wow, that would, that would be fantastic. That would be very awesome. But I remember reading it somewhere mm -hmm. among my, yeah. If you, if you can find that somewhere, that would be great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was it was it you that, uh, Sharon, who, who suggested to me a few weeks ago that we talk a little bit about um, Eleazar ben Yehuda? Uh, and we are going to. He's in my notes. We're going to talk a little bit about that when we get to that in our, our study. But um, he was the guy who actually is credited with resurrecting the Hebrew language. Yes, it, had, it had been dead. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was in the Torah. Mm -hmm. But as far as like a spoken, you know, language, uh, it, it, it had been dead for almost 2,000 years. And that's something else that's happened in the last 100 years now. Yeah. Hebrew is alive and well again. Hebrew so so yeah. if the Hebrew language means they believe it's the voice of heaven, the language of heaven. So yeah, then when they're cool saying idea. that the language will come now, what you're saying is that we all have one language now that it's getting close. Wouldn't it mean that the language would be of heaven? Uh, yeah, so like maybe when Jesus comes, <laughs> we're, we're really pontificating <laughs> here, but when Jesus comes back for the millennial reign, that maybe that will become the lingua franca is, is Hebrew. That's and right. I've, I've been know, studying it, so you guys, you guys better catch up. You better start studying language. Hebrew. Right. Go ahead, Kurt. Uh, Hebrew is your... Religious language has been for years. Arabic was the common language yeah. in the Middle East. Ar Aramaic. The Hebrew, mm -hmm. the Jews were spoken by the rabbis, the teachers, the educated people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the Hebrew scholars, yeah, absolutely. Did. But the uh, Arabic was the language that was most common. Aramaic. Jesus spoke both. Aramaic. It was, it was a Aramaic, yeah. Do you, know, do you know, actually, in the original so book of Daniel, there's a little bit of Aramaic even yes, in Daniel. Is which is yes, kind of interesting, so. Uh, so, but anyways, yeah. So, so we, we've talked about this. This is, I would say that this is, this is the beginning of the spirit of hegemony, which is, which is one nation uh, being the, the dominant power in the world system. This is the beginning of that. But this whole concept of world government, can we trace the roots of this back even further? And here I'm just throwing out just interesting thoughts on doctrine and theology. How, how far back can we go? How far back can we trace the roots of world government? 
And I want to bring this up because I want us to understand just what world government is, just what it means, just how God sees world government. Because it sounds good on the surface. All of us working together, we're going to create a, a utopia here on earth, right? Um, but watch this. And you remember uh, James last week, the new guy, uh, yeah. works at the library? And he said he'd be here tonight. I guess they, they got tied up or something. I was hoping he'd be here. But he actually came up after class and he said this to me and uh, makes a very good point. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's what I was going to say. This is embarrassing to say and I shouldn't even say it, but just try to find a picture of Adam and Eve on Google where they're not actually naked. Yeah. I just didn't want to put nudity on the screen because it's awkward enough in here, right? <laughs> Silence. Okay, anyways. But yes, this is Adam and Eve. I think in the original painting, Eve's showing a little bit more, but somebody painted over with the leaves there. Okay, so okay, so so what do I mean by that? The roots of world government go all the way back to this. Look at look up above Eve's head. What's what? What do you see up there? Serpent. Cambridge cities. I see fruit. What's that? I see fruit. You see that? You see the fruit. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So you're yeah, that's that, that means you're a nice person. You you just see the fruits. Yeah. Anyone see the serpent? <laughs> right. Okay. So um, let's right let's read let's read this story in the Bible. All right. And and I, I want you guys to to tell me if I'm spinning this. Okay. This this is where the roots of world government really come comes from. Okay. That they really come from. Uh, now this is this is the story Genesis chapter three starting verse one. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. And who is the serpent? Yeah, it's, it's Satan, we know, right? Which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Eve, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Did God really say that? Did God really say you shall not eat? Did God say you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Or every tree of the garden? Not exactly. Not exactly. See, this is this is interesting. I, I want I want to give you guys a challenge because this occurred to me years ago. But I even though Satan is called the father of lies, and we know that he is, I can't find one instance in the entire Bible where he actually lies. Okay, this is important. Get this. This is important just in your day to day life. There there's not one instance that I can find in the whole Word of God where he actually lies. What does he do, Ernie? Causes doubt, just question. Did God really say that? And and he twists. So what's what's the root? Wicker. Wicked. Yeah. Wicked. Yeah. So like wicker furniture is all twisted, right? That's where we get yeah. the, the word wicked. Wicker, wicked, wicked right? Means twisted. He twists things. He twists things and gets us to question. But but can we blame Satan for this incident that we're about to see transpire here? Of course not. He he's he's hitting Eve where she knows that or where he knows that she's weak, okay? It's, it's her weakness that he's going after. Don't have a weakness, don't have, a, don't have an open spot yeah, for the enemy. Yeah. How, how do we guard against this? Uh, we're born again, uh, we, we fill ourselves with the word. Most importantly, most importantly, stay filled, overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Every day, Father, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, fill me with your anointing today. Yeah. That's, that's our greatest guard against these little things where the enemy sneaks in. And watch, watch how this progresses here. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. And she remembers what God actually said. Mm -hmm. yeah. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. And what's that tree called? The the tree of of See, I heard, yeah, I heard somebody say the tree of good and evil, but it's important to understand. Slight nuance there, Alan. No. The tree of the knowledge of good yeah. and evil. Yeah. So it's not good and evil. It's, it's, the, it's, yeah. it's the knowledge of good and evil, right? And God said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. He touches where he okay. now, 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 what did God mean when he said that they would die? He meant a couple of things. Spiritual death. Spiritual death. Yeah, so he meant two things. He meant at least two things. He meant that physical death would come into the world, yeah. that, that instead of them getting to some point where God would let them eat of the tree of life and, and live forever, which we're going to get there again. We well, know that, right? Well, it's kind of like baptism. When you, when you die to the, old, to the, to the um, old, and then when you get baptized, you, you renew yourself. So that's what happens there. You'll die in the spiritual, you know, in the spiritual where you're at, and you'll renew into the... Into the, to the and and that's, that's what ended up hap having to happen for mankind because of this event. Because, because this was not God's... You know, really, really perfect will, obviously. I mean, God knew this was going to happen. And, and 
that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, who, who planted it in the garden? Satan did? God. Yeah, God put it there. Yeah, he did. And he stuck it way over in a corner where they wouldn't see it. They, you know, they're not going to get tempted by it. It's just it's hidden over there behind that big rock, right? He put it right in the middle where every day they're going to pass it and they're going to see it. But the word says that, that, that God, Jesus himself said, Jesus himself said that God does not tempt us with evil. He doesn't tempt us to sin. So think about this too. When, I'm getting off on a lot of little details here, but just for fun since we're here. Um, was God, by God putting that tree there for Adam and Eve, and saying, see that beautiful tree right there? You can eat of everything else. Don't eat of that one. And then put it right where they could see it every day. Was he tempting them with sin? Was he no. tempting them with disobedience? What was he tempting them with? This is simple. Because they're... Well, sorry, I have a question. Go ahead. I think, I think so? the tree, because the tree of knowledge would make, would, would maybe think that they would, it would answer their questions, but if they just had faith in him Obedience. on how the world would become then they wouldn't have to seek the knowledge from anybody else but him. Which, which is, was God's intent then? That is God's intent now, 100%. Uh, so so that, that's a good answer. Um, what, oh, you guys know what that means. First of all, it means we have like five minutes left in the class, so I better get a move on here. And it's time for our offering. Thank you for giving. I'm getting ready to publish part three, so come on, guys, pony up. <laughs> Thank you. They, they, and again, thank you guys for always selling in the offering. I, I greatly appreciate it. Every penny goes into the ministry is used strictly for ministry purposes. So God was tempting them with obedience, not disobedience. He was tempting them with obedience. God tempts us with righteousness, doesn't he? Okay. Here, here's, here's free choice. We could, we could look at it like, okay, well, that's, a, that's an opportunity to sin. It's an opportunity not to sin, right? That's, that's how we are to look at it. All right. And it was and also an opportunity of, of, of God to finally to get rid of Satan once and for all. Because well, that's that's the that's ultimate the story. Of, this is the end of the story, but it has to be. It, it's true. It's true. So, there's so a what? Gina. That's tremendous wisdom because there, there we can look at this and say, oh, it's so terrible. But there is an ultimate purpose of this whole story, and we're getting close to the end of this. We're getting close to the end of this. But but physical death came in the world, and also spiritual death, which is what Shelley was saying. Very good. Gold stars for, for everyone who contributed to that point. Uh, spiritual death entered into the world, and this is why we needed God himself to come in the flesh to, to, uh, to bring us back to life spiritually, and eventually physically too, because when Jesus comes back, what's going to happen? The dead will be resurrected. Those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the air to... And we will be transformed, have eternal, immortal, glorious bodies. That's First Corinthians Ooh, chapter fifteen, right? Oh, so that's so. So all of it's coming back. All right, we're in the so process now. now. Uh, then the serpent said to the woman, "You will not surely die," because what he was speaking to was her perception, which is she's thinking, "Gosh, if I take a bite of this fruit, I'm going to drop dead right here in the garden." That's right. And so Satan's not lying when he says this, because he's speaking to her perception. Okay, that's another thing. Be, Ernie will like this one, beware of your own perceptions, right. your own thinking, right? Ernie's been after me about that for 25 years. And I think you're on to something. It's a good point. <laughs> Watch out for your thinking and logic. Okay? For God knows in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. This is the truth. That's it's, it. It's a fact. I'm not going to say the truth. I don't want to use that word with Satan. This is a fact. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is it. This is the whole point right here. Yep. This is what mankind accomplished in the garden. This is what mankind is still trying to do today. Yep. These are the roots of world government right here. Yep. You, will, you will be like God. You'll be your own God. You'll know good from evil. You'll be the judge of it. You'll be the judge of what's right and wrong. And doesn't the Bible say that? Doesn't it prophesy that? That especially in the last days that, that uh, men will call evil good and good evil? Doesn't it say that, right? Uh, a homo homosexual marriage is, is good, right? Because it's just two people who love each other. Abortion is good because, you know, um, we're, we're not, we're not uh, dictating to the woman what to do with her own body, right? You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. You, you, can, you can spin anything to make it look good. Um, uh, preaching the gospel and righteousness, that's evil. You're trying to force your views on somebody else, right? Uh, pre preaching about even mentioning the word hell, that's evil, because, because now you're threatening someone with you know, eternal damnation. That's evil. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. 
uh, today it, it's becoming, um, we're almost to the point, and it's already like this throughout much of the rest of the world, if not most of the rest of the world, where it will be dangerous to be a Christian. It's kind of already, already like that here for us right, now, isn't it? Is don't, don't, we, don't we open ourselves up to, uh, to, to persecution, even today? And I, I don't want to overstate that. I mean, I'm not going to whine and complain because somebody on the internet, you know, you know, lets out some major rant toward me because I'm a Christian pastor or whatever. When you see what's happening to our Christian brothers and sisters in the Middle East, I'm not going to get bent out of shape over that, the little persecutions here. But you see the spirit of it, right? Yeah. And here's how the story ends. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, uh, man's kind of wisdom, Satan's kind of wisdom, right? Apart from God, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So, so these are the roots of rural government. I've got a couple minutes left, which is perfect. This is right where I wanted to end our class for the year. And I'll tell you where we're going to go starting next year. So uh, fast forward way into the future and uh, uh, right up to, to the point where we are now in our discussion, the League of Nations, and, and um, how, how did this unfold? How did it develop? We're not going to look at the evolution of it yet. That will be next time we get together. But, uh, but starting from the Garden of Eden, going all the way up to... You remember, you remember what Adam did when God confronted him? Remember God confronted Adam? <laughs> What did Adam say? I'm sorry, God. You told me, and I, I sinned. Who, you know what's funny about that? Did you hear what Jesus said? He blamed Eve. He didn't just blame Eve. The woman that you well, gave you me, God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Blame God. Oh, talk about human nature. Bla blamed his wife and God. That's that's not going to score you points, guys. Yeah, don't don't do that. Well, we, so some people question God about things. Well, I mean, God, and God says, "Come, let, let us reason Joseph together." Said, you know, yeah. God, why are you doing this? But don't blame God for our sin, right? Well, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. right. <laughs> so right up to this, and you guys remember this, right up to World War I itself. And, and uh, do you guys remember what this is? We're going to end with this. So, say it again. Yeah, three gold stars for Alan because he actually remembered the names of the guys, the French guy and the British guy. Low-level diplomats uh, representing Britain and France. Uh, throughout the period of World War One, this was happening behind closed doors, secret little deal. And do you guys remember what? Why am I bringing this up? Just, just th this, the the whole history of, of world government, in the history of mankind. And I started with the Garden of Eden, and now we're going to leave off here. And then we come back together. We're going to we're going to look at the evolution of this of this process, because uh, j just this little obscure agreement, just these two low level diplomats. No one even knows what's going on. And there was this little stipulation in here, yeah. this little secret pact, and it was what to do with Palestine yeah. because no one could figure out what to do with Palestine. What's Palestine? Israel. It's the Holy Land. That's Israel. So what these two guys decided is that it was going to become the world's first and only international enclave. Again, chills up my spine just, just thinking about the import of this. A non-sovereign territory that would be governed by a heretofore unspecified international body. Wow. Not wild. So, so the seeds of, of, of world government began in the Garden of Eden, manifested pretty strongly with the Tower of Babel, but, but ultimately appeared right here in the middle of World War I with this little secret behind the doors packed between two insignificant guys. And it was, we need, we need an international government, an international body, to govern this one little dot on the map. Jerusalem, of all things. They called it Palestine. It was Jerusalem was, was, was the main focus of, 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 this, of this concern. The world's first and only international enclave. So, so um, can you see this from a spiritual standpoint? Yes. Can, can, you, can, you see, can you see how the, the march of human history from all the way back again to the Garden of Eden and just how it's leading us up just perfectly, beautifully, it's uncanny. To, to the times that we're in today, where just like it's prophesied in the book of Zechariah, Jerusalem would be a heavy stone around the, the necks of all nations. All, all nations would just be obsessed with this little, little town in the middle of nowhere, Jerusalem. Go ahead, Sharon. Actually, I just had a little thought when you talked about that. Do you realize they wanted that to be that one little place? And it is a millstone around the world's neck. Yeah. It's getting there more and more. 
so here comes the hero, the Antichrist, to take over and bring the peace. You know, thank you, Sharon, because she did it again, but I'm making her this time. She's reading off my notes again. <laughs> when we get together uh, in January, so, so again, uh, four, four, no, three weeks off, we'll be back here in four weeks. I'll be chomping at the bit, believe me, to, to get into this, uh, getting into some good stuff here. But um, we're going to look first at uh, this, this uh, term that I coined that you'll never hear anywhere else because it's too complicated, the democratization of hegemony. We should get bumper stickers made. <laughs> Don't look at your faces. <laughs> it's, I know, I, I made it up. Of course it's lame. The de democratization of hegemony. But if you think about it for a second, you might see what I'm getting at. And, and, um, and that, that, that this concept, the democratization of hegemony, is, is what we're talking about when we, when we talk about world government in the modern context, what we have today. And it was prophesied in the book of Daniel, exactly what I just said. We're, we're going to look at that briefly. And then, and then um, just to prove that this idea of world government really is just a major piece of the puzzle, the end time story, is just what Sharon just said. We're going to see how this actually relates to the Antichrist. So shockingly, this, my whole class, These Final Days Ministries, is all about the end times. We're actually going to look at some verses in the book of Revelation, if you can believe it, right? How often do we actually go to the book of Revelation? Anyways, so, so much to look forward to. I wish you guys a very uh, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. And, and don't be offended when I say Happy Holidays. And, and when people like say that to you, oh, you should say Happy Holidays, go ahead and say it because holiday, it actually holy, is two holy words day. put together, holy day. Right. So they think that you're secularizing it, you're not. Happy Holy Days. <laughs> Just say that to them, say, okay, Happy Holy Days. They'll get it. Did you have your hand up? I did. Oh, yes, John. Hello. Yeah, you're really Hi. You're far room my mouth. Didn't realize you were here. Yes, I'm just kidding. Yes. I like your hat. The past couple weeks, I've been uh, thinking a parallel with the Tower of Babel and the recent Mars exploration. So I thought I'd throw that in for you to think about for the next two, three weeks. Yeah, because I have no idea what you're yeah, referring to. I don't, I don't get the connection. He's going to take over the universe. So I'm gonna, I'll think about it for the next four weeks and see if I can. Well, they built, they built the tower to try to reach the heavens. Now we're talking about living on Mars. Oh, we're actually going out in the solar system. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I like that. I like that because God said, you know, it, you know nothing's going to be withheld well, from them, so anything the that they seem to accomplish. The earth sample, or yeah. the soil samples, because they think there is uh, uh, the organisms in water. Under the surface. Oh, John, you realize we're, we're five minutes over and you're opening up a major can of worms here that I would love to get into. But we'll do it in January. So yeah, this is my way life out there. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to be like this for the next month. I can't wait to get back. In. So, yeah, okay. Bring it up again in January. So. All right, guys. So. Sometimes God lets, lets stuff happen for a reason to get your attention to Him instead of on your circumstance. And what the enemy's doing, you're supposed to focus on him. Now what the enemy's doing, we know the enemy is up to no good, but we need to stay focused on him. That's why yeah. those things happen sometimes. It's Amen, not Cheryl. Like he wanted the person to die, he didn't. That's, that's right. And, and we're coming into Christmas time when we celebrate Jesus, and it's a good time to keep our focus on God and what he's done for us and, and his son and all the great gifts. So, all right, guys, let's close in prayer. All right. Praise you, Father God. Lord, we just thank you for tonight, Father. I just thank you for uh, this group of people, Father, that you've called them to be watchmen in this generation. And you've, you've anointed each one in this world to pay attention to these things and dig in and study and, and to understand, to gain understanding. And I thank you, Father God, that you are supernaturally revealing these things to us, that lights are going on every time we get together, every time we pray on our own, study on our own, Father God. And I just thank you for that. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Word, Father God. And uh, Lord, this season, we just give you all the, every season, Father, we just give you all the praise and glory and honor. And we're so excited for what you're doing in these times. And uh, we, we just wait with great anticipation for the times that are coming, uh, not with any kind of fear or trepidation, but just boldness and courage uh, and faith for the times that are coming, Father. And we just say, like Jesus said to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth as, as it is in heaven. And Father, just ask you to bless each one as they go tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name, and give everybody a merry Christmas and happy holy days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. amen. Thanks, you guys. All right. So this will usually say, come back next week, come back next year.